But in 1988, there was an international tour starring Cheetah Rivera and the Radio City Rockettes, and fresh off his engagements, starring in Broadway's lesser appreciated musicals of the 80s black patent leather shoes and late night comic, Don Stitt. And here to speak about that legendary tour of Can Can, Don Stitt. about musicals uh, from the 50s with, with these two, and I, I hate to say this, but I have two pays older than you, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, Ron Holgate and the Rockheads started our Can Can tour, and our choreographer was Alan Johnson, who created the springtime for, the, for Hitler routine in, in the original movie, The Producers. Uh, while we were touring the U.S., Donna McKechnie was playing Pistache in London twice, and... Um, for those of you who don't know, the artist's subplot of Can Can concerns Boris, uh, in this case played by Larry Reagan, uh, being pressured into a duel with the critic by his friend, Theo Field, here played by me, uh, and Michael Conlon was our critic. When Boris faints before the duel, Theo Field has to briefly take up the, soul, uh, the sword to fight the duel for Boris before fainting himself. I worked up what I thought was, you know, a, a nice little pantomime ballet sort of thing, uh, borrowing heavily from Red Skelton and Bill Irwin. And uh, we, uh, you know, we had him working up for, for his fencing exercises. And then when he got up to uh, the critic, I had him faint into a, a backward roll, into a handstand, to a dead collapse. And in the rehearsal room, Cheetah came over and she said, that's going to stop the show. I don't do a good Cheetah Rivera because my voice isn't low enough. <laughs> Uh, anyway, we opened the show in Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, I was amazed that my Chaplin-esque little ballet got absolutely nothing at the first performance. I racked my brains before the uh, second performance, and I concluded I had been undone by opening night jitters. And at the second performance, I again died a horrible comedic death. Now, on the long bus ride from Knoxville to Cleveland, I obsessed about this routine, and then I realized what was missing. You know, it's been said that the guy who really made stars of the Three Stooges was the sound effects guy at Columbia. Because until he added the sounds of the coconuts and the slapping fish, they seemed too violent. But with those crazy sound effects, then it was okay for audiences to laugh. So I meandered to the back of the bus where our percussionist was sitting. Uh, Alan Herman had been the drummer on the original Broadway casts of uh, Jesus Christ Superstar and a chorus line. I didn't know how he was going to react to the idea of a little comedic conspiracy, but I outlined what I wanted to do and, and suggested we could talk through it at the hotel room in Cleveland uh, before the show, and that's what we did. Uh, we added all the percussionists' favorite toys, cowbells, ratchets, slide whistles, tweeting birdies, anything we figured Red Skelton would have thrown in, and we scored it like a one-minute comic ballet. Now, <clears throat> As a stage manager myself, let me tell you, under normal circumstances, I would have run this by the stage manager. <laughs> it would have been the professional, proper, reasonable thing to do, but unfortunately, I knew what this stage manager would have said. Uh, he was a sadist. I'd seen how he treated the Rockettes. He would have said no. <laughs> so we just did it. And now the gag truly did stop the show. And if it need be said, uh, this drummer, Alan Herman, is still one of my best friends for saving this routine for me. I was absolutely elated for the rest of the second act until I heard the hated stage manager page me to the stage after the performance. Now you have to imagine both the stage manager and the director approaching me at top speed <laughs> I'm really lucky the director got there first because he was delighted with the reaction. Please, don't change a thing. And then the stage manager descended into a silent rage, especially reserved for me, which he nurtured for 440 performances. <laughs> but, you know, now I had a show stopping bit so he couldn't hurt me. Uh, now, life on the road can be uh, tough. There's just no getting around that. But if you have... Dolores Conchita Figueroa del Rivero, who 
during a short time when she was working as a chorus girl in the Can Can in the 50s, she claims that she was known as Cheetah O'Hara. Uh, if you have Cheetah O'Hara in your show, you will rarely be bored. I will tell you that, uh, confidentially, uh, the woman we might consider to be Broadway's greatest living dancing star is, in fact, capable of being a little mischievous troublemaker when she gets bored. I'll tell you that uh, Cheetah had a Pee Wee Herman doll with her. <laughs> that Pee Wee Herman doll had a knack for showing up in some of the least likely Parisian locales, occasionally in period costume. Um, Cheetah had sustained a broken leg some months earlier, uh, leaving a performance of Jerry's Girls on Broadway. She had about nine pins in her leg. It was doubtful she would ever dance again. This tour was the chance to show the world that she could still do it, and that's exactly what she did. Now, there's much to tell about that tour of Can Can, but there was one anecdote from our tour that really demonstrates the unpredictable nature of life on the road. The, tri the trip from Toledo to Des Moines would have consumed pretty much every minute that the Union would have allowed for that day's travel, uh, even, uh, even if we'd been on time. And when Larry Reagan got on the bus that day, he had a head cold. It was an otherwise pleasant February day when we started out, but it was a long trip to Chicago where we were supposed to change buses, and it became apparent that the amount of luggage that the Rockettes traveled with was going to throw us way off schedule. And uh, by the time we got onto the new bus with the new bus driver and we pulled out of the mall in Chicago, the company manager wanted to broker a deal. If the company would waive the overtime that we were certain to accrue, he would buy dinner for the entire company at a local truck stop. <laughs> Unfortunately, the new bus driver chose to dine with us instead of check on the readiness of his vehicle for the remainder of the journey. As a result, we were riding on an unlit section of Highway 80 near Amana, Iowa, sometime after midnight of February 26th, 1988, when the bus ran out of gas and lost electrical power during a blizzard. We were stranded at the side of the road, just waiting for some drunken trucker to squash us like a tin can in the darkness. The company manager and his boyfriend, Larry Reagan's understudy, uh, set out on foot to find someone to rescue our company. And in the ensuing 90 minutes, Michael Connolly wandered up and down the aisles, soliciting personal information from the Rockettes, which he would turn into stand-up comedy. It was as if David Niven was channeling David Letterman. That was uh, outrageous, entertaining, consistently hilarious stuff. It took our minds off of how very cold and vulnerable we were. And I have to say, Michael was a hero that night, in my opinion. He kept us from freaking out. Around 2 a.m., five cop cars and a cattle semi showed up. <laughs> The Rockettes were to be escorted by the policemen who, who all wanted to be able to brag about riding with the Rockettes. And the men, however, were herded into the back of the cattle semi where the truck floor was slick with cow urine. And we grabbed onto the framing struts on the sides for support and we braced ourselves for transport to the nearest Holiday Inn. The corrugated door slammed shut and we were plunged into total darkness. And I thought, hi diddly dee, and that was my turn. The Amara Holiday Inn was near enough to Des Moines that we were able to make the matinee, and it was a struggle. Uh, Larry had developed walking pneumonia sitting on the cold on the bus, and he barely made it through the matinee. He said he didn't feel he could do the other three shows that weekend under the circumstances, but unfortunately, his understudy had also contracted pneumonia while searching for a rescue party on foot during the blizzard, so the remaining three shows in Des Moines were canceled, and we all got to fly home for 48 hours. The company manager and his boyfriend were fired, and the company's stinginess had cost the producers between fifty and hundred thousand dollars that weekend. But that wasn't the end of the bus saga. <laughs> Tuesday night in the next city, I heard our equity deputy Ron Holgate <laughs> discussing the matter with our producer over the green room phone. It sounded something like this. What you fail to understand is that we, the actors, are your commodity, and you can't 
cannot transact commerce successfully if your commodity has been compromised. Now, let us say your commodity was ping pong balls. What do you think would have happened to your commodity if you had left it by the side of I-80 in the dark during a blizzard? That's right, your ping pong balls would have been squashed. Your commodity would be damaged and you would be unable to successfully transact your commerce. Memo to self, always elect Ron Deputy, even if he's not in the city. <laughs> I learned a lot about professionalism and perseverance during that run, and one memory I cherish is watching Cheetah from the wings every night singing, I've Got You Under My Skin, which was interpolated into our production. It's one of my favorite songs, and I never grew tired of it watching and listening to one of the greats singing one of the greatest hits by one of our greatest songwriters. Near the end of the tour, we made a stop at Hollywood's Pancages, and I was leaving the dressing room area for a night, and I, I saw a grandmotherly woman whose face I recognized, but I couldn't place. I thought perhaps it was one of my mother's friends. And then as she got closer to me, I realized who it was. It was Gwen Verdon coming by to say hello to her old friend, Cheetah O'Hara. <laughs> I wasn't going to miss an opportunity like this, so as I passed her in this narrow hallway, I said, Oh, Lola, you can have my soul anytime. <laughs> in an instant, that grandmotherly woman lost 20 years. She straightened up, tucked in her tummy, shot me a disapproving glance over her shoulder and said, Fresh. <laughs> Broadway has changed much in the years since our tour, but uh, it's you young people who want to learn the lessons of the past that give me hope for Broadway's future. I hope you each have the occasion to watch the greats from the wings and maybe watch them hide the occasional Pee Wee Herman doll. <laughs> and now uh, I've been asked to sing uh, one of the least recognizable songs from this one, but the one that we hope will uh, take in the spirit of this evening's endeavor. Some think an artist's life could never be sad. Some think an artist's life could only be bad. When people ask about la vie de Bohème, what do we, what do we say to them? We say never, never be an artist. <laughs> If you think you can make one cent, no, 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 never, never be an artist. If you've no one to pay your rent, never, never be an artist. If you like roast beef called prime, never, never be an artist unless you want to have a marvelous time. Unless you want to have a marvelous time. You can wake when you please, you can sleep when you please, you can laugh when you please, you can weep when you please, you can laze when you please, or be spry when you please. You can do anything but buy when you please. You can date who you please, you can please who you can please, you can charm who you please, you can tease who you please, you can flirt when you please, take a chance when you please, you can put on or take off your pants when you please. I'll never, never be an artist. Think you can make one cent? Never, never be an artist if you've no one to pay your rent. Never, never be an artist if you're faithful to your wife. Never, never be an artist unless you want to have a wonderful life. Unless you want to have a wonderful life. Unless you want to have.